Here, we'll look at the context of Native America. In this lecture, I'll introduce some of the intellectual context and common characteristics of Native American tribal spirituality, but we'll say from the outset that each of you should, before you leave this place, take a class in the Native American Studies Department, which is rare on campuses and wonder a wonderful part of our own campus. So, on to Native America. One of the problems with studying the indigenous traditions of America, of the Americas generally, but because we're already dealing with wild diversity, we'll focus on the political context of the states. One of the problems with studying these traditions is that the relationship of the colonial peoples and the native peoples was always unbalanced. The colonialists who have become the dominant culture and whose university culture we're now studying in were settler colonialists and have historically from first contact treated the native peoples with frankly shameful violence. So the studier and the colonizer have been roughly overlapping categories since the time of first encounter. The colonized and the object of study have been similarly overlapping categories. And this has been true of the situation the world over. Now, indigenous traditions means traditions that are born within a place, which, because all traditions were born in a place, really means traditions, groups of people, communities, who have moved less over the modern period and, and who have tended, therefore, uh, to be small-scale tribal cultures. Now, it isn't that these cultures were comprised of people who were somehow less curious, uh, less interested in understanding the world, um, and the people with whom they shared this world, less inclined to study. That's not it. And, it. and it also doesn't mean that these cultures were weaker somehow and, and therefore had to submit themselves to the scrutiny of more powerful invaders. There are plenty of reasons, of course, uh, reasons for why the colonizing forces and the studying forces have been overlapping categories, while the indigenous cultures and the studied cultures have also been overlapping categories. But one that will help us get into our own topic is, uh, is that one generally shared characteristic of indigenous traditions of native cultures, which again, generally refers to communities that have remained connected to their traditional homelands, uh, rather than societally participating in the largely colonial, large-scale migrations of the past five or six hundred years, one shared characteristic of these cultures is their approach to knowledge, to the act of studying, what it means to seek knowledge. Now, I cannot say it enough uh, that as throughout the semester in a survey course like this one, we're talking in broad strokes here. Still, the colonizer's approach to knowledge is one that we know and we live within. And you know, to our creditor at long last working to develop um, you know, a more enriched version of alternatives to. On this model, knowledge is a kind of external, reified thing. It can be collected and having been collected, it can be stored in isolation from a community, in a book on a shelf, say. Then having been stored or archived, it can be accessed again by an isolated individual who then knows it or has the knowledge. This is an objective model and, and there are perks to this, of course, a model according to which knowledge is an object and it can be owned. Well, for better or for worse, with its perks and its downfalls, this is not the model of knowledge that is primarily operative within indigenous cultures. For these small scale tribal cultures, knowledge isn't understood on an objective model. It's more of an intersubjective reality. On the second model, it doesn't make sense to isolate knowledge from the knowing community because knowledge is only knowledge insofar as it, in, is it, in, it is enlivened by experience. So it isn't generally the case, it doesn't generally make sense for these cultures to go out and study others, collect and archive information on others. Knowledge here is embodied and transmitted through direct personal relationship sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes through uh, collective storytelling, song, dance. So on the one hand, native cultures have not been inclined to go out and study others. And on the other hand, their experience has been such that those who studied them have generally done so as part of a larger colonial project. Now, in large part because of this colonial history of more or less successful attempts at conquest, uh, indigenous communities have until very recently, and it's it is getting better, but it still hasn't. It still isn't what we might call good. It's not very. Um, it's not all butterflies and unicorns. There's a lot of recuperation to be done, um, healing. But until very recently, these communities have been disinclined to open their cultures to the studious eyes of outsiders because, again, such an approach to knowledge wasn't natural. And on the other hand, the studious eye has not, in general, been politically or militaristically neutral. And I, 
don't mean with academic language to downplay what I'm talking about here. The history of encounter is a disgrace. Uh, one, but only one case in point, the forced adoption of Native American children, or more frankly, the federally subsidized and supported kidnapping of Native children from their homes was legal until 1978. And this political context, including the vying models, incommensurate models of knowledge, created a context where the ethics of authenticity has been a genuine concern. So that a member of a Native community would, uh, you know, engage in scholarship, you know, and, and, you know, and then maybe his sense, his or her own sense of knowledge, and therefore his or her own cultural authenticity was, was questioned internally and by the community. And, and as our cultural is culture has become increasingly aware that marginalizing and silencing voices diminishes and depletes the whole, and that historically marginalized voices belong in the center of a shared conversation that is culture, um, this has begun to change. It is changing. So we, we just can't approach, begin to approach these traditions without knowing this, without being aware that there are limits to the degree to which an ostensibly objective outsider can understand an intersubjectively knowing community. We, as religious studies scholars, will face the same issue with each tradition we'll look at to a greater or lesser degree. History has progressed such that it is writ large here in beginning an academic class by studying indigenous spiritual traditions. And this moment will help us to see the issue more clearly later. So you can't know what it is to be a Buddhist if you don't know that this phenomenal existence is samsaric illusion and that your greatest goal is to escape it. You know, you can't really know what it is to be a Christian if you don't know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior who died for your sins and that your greatest goal is to return to him in a heavenly afterlife. So something of this will be familiar territory. With indigenous traditions, though, the issue is compounded uh, by politics of marginalization, by a history of oppression and violence. And so we come back to the question of knowledge. You know, what, what can you know? And how do you get that knowledge? You know, how does your lens, your bias, affect what you see? For a very long time, the scholars whose heirs we all are could not see Native American spiritual tradition. Remember Amerigo Vespucci? We all learned about him, the Italian explorer and cartographer after whom these United States were named. That guy? Here's what he said of the Native populations he encountered. Quote, they have no laws and no religious belief, but live according to the dictates of nature alone. They know nothing of the immortality of the soul. He looked at the native folks here and said, they don't have a church. They don't have religion. So they're not idolaters, really. They just aren't religious. It's irrelevant to them. And Columbus, he felt the same. He reported back to Europe that the native folks whom he encountered had no creed, quote, appeared to have no religion. Now, one of the greatest challenges for the early colonialists, which they did not themselves recognize, was that they took for granted a written culture a world where knowledge, to be counted as knowledge, could be isolated, reified, objectified. But that is not what they found in the Americas. Overwhelmingly, the native traditions, uh, in the native traditions, um, they found the sacred stories, prayers, songs, dances, were to the people for whom they were meaningful, in actuality, spiritual forces that shaped the world. The only meaningful knowledge was, and often is, knowledge that, that's enacted, it's expressed, it's embodied. Experience here is marked by a relational consciousness. A person is and acts only as part of a community. That relational consciousness has been enacted and embodied in a wide variety of ways throughout the tribal traditions of the Americas. From the green corn dance of eastern woodland and southeastern tribes, like the Cherokee, Seminole, and Iroquois, to the sun dance of the Plains tribes, like the Cheyenne and the Kiowa and the Arapaho, to the soil ceremony of the Zuni and Hopi tribes, and finally to the world renewal ceremony of the tribes of the North Coast, like the Hupa and the Yurok, Karuk, Wiat, and Talawa. The, uh, the image here is not of the ceremony itself, but of the final village before the Wiat resumed the world re renewal dance after it had been interrupted by the slaughter of over 100 uh, men, women, and children while they slept on Talawa in Humboldt Bay in 1860. Now that relational consciousness is bodied forth in each of these practices and, and so many more. One way to understand what I mean by relational consciousness is through a sort of contrast with the worldview or foundational consciousness that most of us living in the 21st century American context are most familiar with. We might think of the post-enlightenment, post-industrial, post-modern mind as egocentric. And by that, I don't mean that everybody's just a jerk, which is how we usually use the word egocentric. I mean that we're taught, you know, we're nurtured to believe that the I 
is at the center of our perceptual abilities and our sense of agency. I think, therefore I am. And who cares really about what anyone else might say about that, right? Now contrast that with the relational consciousness I've been describing or what we might call an ecocentric worldview. This is a worldview according to which interconnection in both time and space sits at the center of experience. I am because I am connected to the non-human peoples, to the ancestors, and to those not yet born. They, all of them, have influence on my experience, on my perceptual abilities, and on my sense of agency. The trees, the salmon, the raven, they're bound up with me, and I with them. And so I honor them, and I conduct myself in such a way that harmony and health result. But there's no separating myself to do that. Now that's a big idea, and it's one we're spending a little time with, each of us, really considering how our daily lives might play out differently the more we lean into one or the other side of the contrast. Religion, spiritual traditions, worldviews have historically done a lot of things. One of those is to shape societal tendencies for good and for bad, but either way, significantly. And so we might consider how our communities and our world might look a little different, might operate a little differently, if we could mobilize toward this kind of shift on a large scale. And it's not altogether a question of, you know, what ifs and maybes. Climatic, geological, and biological forces on our increasingly full planet are pressing that shift. The real question is how we respond. So next time we'll turn our attention uh, a little bit to some of the more marginal ways that our contemporary society has responded. We'll touch on new age movements, neo-paganism, atheism. See you then.